Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Hope for the Humble, Dr. McLuhan teaches how Jesus opened the door of heaven to all who are poor in spirit. Today we'll launch a series of messages on the blessings of Jesus. These messages we will learn what Jesus or how Jesus wants us to respond to people who are unkind, mean, or outright hateful to us. Now, the main theme of the Gospel of Matthew is a topic that he liked to call the kingdom of God. John the Baptist began his ministry by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2, Matthew wrote, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. That was not until we get to chapter 5 that we receive instructions from Jesus on what the kingdom of heaven actually is. We've been hearing about it, and he's been proclaiming it, and people are saying, well, what is the kingdom of heaven? And we're about to find out. In what has come to be called the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus disclosed how he wants people to live. This teaching of Jesus is so radically different than the religious thinking of the day that he needed to build a trust of the people before he could share the message that God gave him to share. Let's take a moment and see how Jesus prepared the people. These verses tell us exactly what Jesus did to earn the trust of the people who listened to him in that day. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming what? The kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And his fame spread through all of Syria. Can you imagine? That's a long way away from Galilee. And they brought to him all the sick, that is the people from Syria, brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, and those oppressed by demons, and those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Matthew chapter 4, verse 24. These are remarkable verses. Never really understood fully how they fit in with the story. But before Jesus began this important teaching, he earned the trust of people. You see, Jesus most often healed before he preached, and then after he preached, he healed again. He healed every known disease that people suffered from in the first century. Jesus earned the right to tell people that they needed to change their life to be pleasing to God because of the tremendous curiosity that had been created. People who were healed before Jesus preached raised their curiosity. What is it? How is it that you are able to heal? A person who is healed automatically asks this question, how did you heal me? And that's happened to me so many times after I've prayed for people. People usually ask me, who are you? And how were you able to do that? And that's exactly what we want to happen when we touch people with the power of God. And it's a huge blessing to say the healing did not come from me and it doesn't come from you. It comes out of the heavenly Father whose power flows through our lives and heals people. And so before Jesus taught the people how they should respond in difficult situations, he healed every disease that was known in the first century. And I want you to know that every single disease that was listed in these texts that we have just read have either flowed through my hands or they have flowed through the hands of our network partners. And so I command your disease to go right now. And if you're blind, I command your eyes to open. And if you're deaf, I command your ears to open. And if you're mute, I command your tongue to speak. And all infirmities go. Infirmities are diseases that are connected with some kind of demonic activity. That's uh, what it means when you come across that word in the Bible. It's an evil spirit at work. So I command those spirits to go along with their physical affliction. So cancer be healed, epileptic seizures, stop right now. Paralytics, get up and walk and be healed by the power of Jesus. (laughs) If you were just healed, would you write to me? 
and let me know what God has done for you. Now, with that as a background, we're ready to hear about this radical teaching of Jesus. So turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew chapter 5. And Matthew tells us, seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. What a lovely expression this is. Uh, just outside of Capernaum is a delightful slope leading to a fairly small hill. And the word mountain is the same word for hill in the New Testament. And it's most likely this is the place where this message was given. That hill forms what could be referred to as a natural amphitheater. And I've had the privilege of worshiping God in that atmosphere, in that amphitheater, and that atmosphere, and speaking and just feeling the presence of God rise as we worship together in that place. I've heard some lovely messages even on these sayings right from the spot where without a doubt within 100 feet or more, even as 1,000 feet, right in the zone where he said it. Now, we should not think of this message as being given just in one place and one time. Uh, you know, when pro conference preachers go around, they use the same sermons in different places because there's anointing on it. And this was the anointed message that Jesus gave over and over and over again, not because he didn't have another message, but because this was the important message for people to understand why he came to earth and the message that God gave him to bring. And so uh, we uh, give thanks to God for the blessing of uh, sharing uh, this uh, message in that place. <clears throat> and it would have been uh, for, easy for people to see the face of Jesus. They were sitting on higher ground. Don't think of Jesus climbing to the top and speaking down. The people climbed up, and he went up a little ways and then sat down, and then the people went up higher just like we do in amphitheaters today, and the sound emanated up. Now, I love this very common Eastern expression that Matthew uses to introduce Jesus and the message. Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, Jesus had waited 30 years for this moment to arrive. He came to release the most powerful message he had ever been preached, that had ever been preached in Galilee. And Isaiah's prophetic moment had arrived, and Jesus was ready to release it. This, this opening your mouth is not a, a mechanical thing. It's, it's, a, it's an emotional thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual thing. And he was about to release a message. And sometimes I release messages that I feel like I've been prepared all of my life to release. Sometimes you just have a very strong feeling that that's something God wants you to say. And you open your mouth and the spirit begins to work. So the people, Isaiah said, who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2. That was written 700 years before this moment. And the moment came for Jesus to release the light. Are you ready for the light? <laughs> the 12 simple words that Jesus used. Lit a candle that can never be extinguished. Are you ready to hear these very precious words? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. And what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Jesus is not talking about being financially poor. He's talking about being spiritually poor. This is a message to rich people. This is a message to poor people. It's a message to people of every strata of society, every financial bracket that you could imagine. Jesus is saying are you ready to be blessed by Jesus and to lose your spiritual brokenness? Nothing like that had ever been heard anywhere in the world from any religious or spiritual leader. It is an invitation to come and to stand before God with nothing in your hands and accept what he has done for you and for me. Now to help you feel this text just a little bit more, I want to quote uh, this verse from several different translations, what is sometimes referred to as an expanded translation. And these expanded translations bring out nuances and meanings that make it easier for us to understand what Jesus actually said. 
you're blessed and you're at the, when you're at the end of your rope, with less of you, there is more of God and his rule. And that an interesting thought, you are blessed when you're at the end of your rope, how many of you think of being blessed when you come to the end of your rope? <laughs> you don't think of, you think of being, oh no, <laughs> it's about to be a disaster. And this expanded translation, the Message Bible that I use quite often, conveys the idea that when you get stuck and we're at the end of your rope, you finally have a chance for God to get your attention and to say something to you with less of you there's more of God and his rule. And God wants you to have less of you and more of him and his thought and power and rule in our lives. Here's the New Living Translation, NLT. It's a, a translation we hear quite often in this congregation. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, and the kingdom of heaven is theirs. What a wonderful way of thinking about it. So wherever you are on the spectrum that I've spoken about of wealth, health, and livelihood, food, whatever it is, people write to us every day with very deep needs from a poverty standpoint. This message is for you. Here's one more translation, the Passion Translation. Many people are using this translation. If you don't have a Passion Translation, I encourage you to purchase one if you can, and then enjoy this uh, amplified understanding. When wealth is offered to you, what wealth is offered to you when you feel your spiritual poverty? I don't think I said it quite right to feel it yet. What wealth is offered to you when you feel your spiritual poverty? for there is no charge to enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. Uh, and it just keeps giving deeper meanings and feeling. So Jesus is actually presenting the gospel for the very first time. The message that your spirituality is not enough. You need more. You need me. You need to draw from me the life that I came to give to you. And so this First blessing, this first beatitude, as some people call it, is the blessing of salvation. And we need to be humble to come to God and to receive the salvation that he is offering us. Without any more explanation, the Spirit of God is already releasing people from a heavy burden, from the burdens of religion, that the world has placed upon them. I just feel it, I felt it in my spirit as I prepared this message. Right now, at this very moment, as I quoted this verse to you from four different ways, the Spirit of God just opened your eyes. And the Spirit of God opened your eyes, we invite you to lay down your heavy burden of being religious and trying to earn your salvation and put it in the hands of Jesus, come to him humbly, and simply ask Jesus to save you from your sin. Remember, that was the message that John the Baptist and Jesus preached. Repent. I invite you to repent of your religious ways and receive Jesus as your Savior. If your eyes have been opened to see what you cannot earn, that you cannot earn your way to heaven, embrace these words of Jesus. Open your palms towards heaven. Admit that you are a sinner and ask God to give you the gift of eternal life. And these beautiful words as we contemplate them this morning. Now for others listening, uh, to this message you're hearing a voice saying, it can't be that simple. That's actually the biggest problem with the gospel. The devil tells you it can't be that simple. You gotta do something. You gotta be worthy of God's love. You got to somehow earn God's love. You're not worthy to come into God's presence. The devil loves to say things like that. You've got to do something to earn your salvation. So many people write to me about that. <clears throat> That's the response to the message of the religious leaders at the time of Jesus. They said, no, that's not good enough. You have to do something. You can't just receive it as a gift. And Jesus accused these religious leaders of laying religious duty and burdens upon people that they themselves were not keeping. 
In another message on the kingdom of heaven, Jesus added these words about the religious leaders of the day. So you, uh, have, you also have an outward appearance of being righteous to others, but within you, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 28. Religious people like to keep up appearances and have a religious appearance. And, and Jesus is not at all interested. He, 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 it's not about the outside in, it's about the inside out. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in my heart. He wants to win our heart. No matter what the outside looks like right now, he's in the process of changing us from the inside out. Religious people like to put on a pretense or to look pious. Um, Religion is worn like a robe, others to see, but it's only a public facade. Inside their lives, they are unchanged and they have no assurance of salvation. Recently, I've had a number of conversations with people who've actually said that to me. When I've asked them about having hope of going to heaven, people have said to me, nobody can know, only God can know. But aren't you so glad you can know? And God has said we can know. It's not being presumptuous on our part because God knows you can never do enough to feel like you earned your way. A man said to me just plainly and clearly just recently, I've done enough good, I'll be in heaven. I know he didn't believe that. I know he didn't feel it in his heart, but I just uh, kept radiating the presence and power of Jesus in the conversation. People really do believe if the good outweighs the bad, we'll go up. If the bad (laughs) uh, bad, uh, outweighs the good, we'll go down. It's not like that. There's not a single sin in heaven. And one sin disqualifies from heaven. That's why Jesus said, you gotta come. You're blessed if you come humbly, admit that you're broken, that you're bankrupt spiritually, that you can't do enough to earn God's favor. That's what this first blessing of Jesus is all about. So I've seen people all over the world do their best to earn a place in heaven. Some religions ask their followers to walk on fire. I've actually been to fire walking ceremonies, photographed the ceremony, and seen what people actually walk on. That's not a fake. That's not a television uh, thing. It's actually real and put hooks in their bodies and through their tongues and and all sorts of things to try to please their God. Some of the Eastern religions are trying to prove their worth or their devotion to God to get some good karma or to get something coming in their favor. Uh, One of our HSP students visited a religious mountain uh, in Tibet called Mount Kailash, Uh, And this mountain, uh, Jesus is on a hill, but this is a real mountain. (laughs) But what Jesus did on the hill negated what they do on that mountain. There's 17 miles of religious trail around this mountain, going as high as 17,000 feet. Even hard to draw air, unless you're trained for your lungs to breathe in that thin air. And people from every major religion hike around this trail. And if that weren't enough, people from some religions crawl on their bellies, just pull themselves on their elbow, 17 miles to 17,000 feet to try to earn their way with God and hope that they will have some kind of blessing, uh, good karma coming to their lives because they did this wonderful deed. Now, while the student was there, his team prayed for people who were blind, their eyes were opened. They'd never seen anything like that. And some of them had never heard the name of Jesus, but because eyes were opened, people wanted to know, by what power did you do this? And the eyes that opened the physical, uh, the person, the one who opened the physical eyes, Jesus will open their spiritual eyes and see what salvation is all about. Uh, some religions invite their per, uh, participants to... Uh, to uh, to spin prayer drums. Have you ever seen people spinning prayer drums? Flying flags uh, that uh, come apart and, and as the prayers, uh, as the fabric comes apart in the wind, so their prayers are taken to heaven. Uh, some religions invite people to empty their minds of all thoughts, especially negative or painful thoughts. And that's not at all what Jesus or God wants us to do. Jesus wants us to fill our minds with the thought that God loves you God understands you. God cares about you. And he sent Jesus as the word of God into this world 
to die for our sins and to make us his child. Some religions ask their participants to beat themselves and to shed their own blood as a way to earn their favor. I've listened to a number of testimonies about people who went through this process and even having a sword hit on the center of the top of their head and the blood just coming down. Uh, isn't it so much easier to receive the blood of Jesus than to shed your own blood? I heard a lady say, I don't want a God that I had to die for. I want a God that's willing to die for me. <laughs> isn't that a lovely way of understanding it? And Jesus was willing to die for you and me. Uh, what we bless his name today. And so if you have done all your religion has asked you to do and you still feel empty, we invite you today to receive the blessing that Jesus has for you today. He wants to bless you. The word bless means to be happy. In some uh, ways of translating, it means to be fortunate. We don't think of having good fortune when we think of Jesus, but it's the meaning of the word. And we are indeed fortunate if we know the message of Jesus and have received him as our savior. Uh, some translation begin these uh, beatitudes by saying wonderful news and then they translate to go on and say blessed are the poor in spirit. Many translations use the word beatitude. It's an English word that's kind of hard to put together. I heard one person put it this way. It's referring to what our attitude can be in the situations we face in life when the Spirit of God is in us. So beatitude helps us to be the person that God has called us to be. Now we can only do this with the power of Christ. This blessing of Jesus sets the tone for all of the other blessings of Jesus that we're, will follow as we continue in this series of messages. Over the next three years, Jesus looked for people to whom he could make this offer. Blessed are the poor in spirit for yours. Your inheritance is the kingdom of God. Religious people like Nicodemus, military people like the Roman soldier who turned to Jesus. He said, I'm not worthy to have you under my house. I suppose you and I might understand a person saying that. But Jesus was quite willing to come under his house, under his roof, and to be in his home because Jesus wasn't looking at the outward appearance. He was looking at who that Roman soldier would become. And if you feel some shame that you're not worthy to be in the presence of God, uh, sometimes when I go overseas, people touch my feet and then they touch their head and they're saying to me, uh, your... <laughs> Your feet are higher than my head. It's a, it's a way of uh, giving deference. It's a cultural thing. But just pull people up and just uh, say, no, 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 no need to touch my feet. It's Jesus' feet we could touch. Right? And enjoy his presence and his power. Uh, so the sinner who prayed, have mercy on me, was a candidate for this prayer, that this blessing that Jesus offered. The fisherman who said, depart from me, I am an unclean man with a kind of recipient that Jesus made this offer. Blessed are you when you're broken and you're poor in spirit because yours, your reward, will be the kingdom of heaven. The sick people who cried out, have mercy on me, were the recipients of this great blessing and this great offer from Jesus. All of them had found no hope and all of them found hope in what Jesus offered them. This powerful blessing prepared the hearts of people to hear these words of Jesus. Come to me, come to me, you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. Aren't these wonderful words? Yeah. Do you feel a longing to have a load lifted off of you and watching the message? And as you've heard these words, perhaps for the very first time, you've not understood that you can lay down your burden at the feet of Jesus and receive him as your salvation. Salvation is a free gift for the rich, the poor, and everyone in between. Healing 
is a free gift for the rich, the poor, and everyone in between. Humility is the key to receiving from God everything that he has for us. May God help you to humble yourself in front of our great God and receive the blessing that he has for you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. If you're ready to leave religion behind and receive Jesus as your Savior, ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins and make you his child. Come Holy Spirit, fill and heal people who are praying with me right now. If you just prayed with me, write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Father, help us to never forget that you are looking at our hearts. We lay down our efforts to impress you or impress others. We come in humble dependence for salvation and to know the meaning for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.